This is The Long Road to Ruin, and I am your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And we've got a special edition of The Long Road to Ruin tonight. Now, let me just say this. We were not going to do, when we decided that we were going to do The Long Road to Ruin and look at movie franchises, we were not going to touch the Star Wars franchises, not the... uh, not the first trilogy, not the prequel trilogy. We weren't going to do any of it. But let me tell you a quick story. Best buddy, my friend Tom and I, we used, we saw all the prequel tr- um, Star Wars movies together. And I was living in Miami at the time. He was in New York. And we both met in Orlando. And we saw the very last Star Wars prequel trilogy, Revenge of the Sith, together, like friends do. And we left that movie... And we looked at each other, and he said, worst movie ever. And I looked at him, and I said, best movie ever. And then we engaged in a lightsaber duel. No, that's not what happened. But we did disagree. We said, we both had very different opinions on this. And then, for two grown men, we just spent the next several hours arguing about this. And ever since then, we've continued to argue about this movie, neither one willing to move from our perch. Which was the better movie, Revenge of the Jedi or Re- uh, Revenge of the Sith or Return of the Jedi? And so, for your amusement tonight, we will engage in the Lincoln-Douglas debate of nerd fandom, which is the better Star Wars trilogy uh, conclusion, Return of the Jedi or Revenge of the Sith? I'm going to bring out Tom in just a moment, but first, the Shawn Michaels to this Triple H versus The Undertaker duel. Here he is, folks. Sean Comer. How you doing, Sean? I am, quite frankly, a little bit exhausted right now, but I'm never so tired as to sit here, lay back, relax, and for a change, do precious little except keep you two in line. That's right. All right, so after that kind of an introduction, let me go ahead and introduce him. My best friend since we were infants... Here he is, folks, from the uh, People's Republic of New York, Mr. Tom List. Hello, Tom. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Your face okay? Uh, Stains a few teeth, but otherwise okay. You ready to do this? You ready to be the uh, Douglas to my Lincoln? Uh, yes, I am. I'm ready to humor you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn the reins over to Sean, who's going to moderate this debate. We're going to start here uh, with some opening remarks. I'll go first, and then I'll defer to Tom. Sean, you ready to do this? You ready to take control over this uh, disaster piece? I am indeed, Mark Mattis. Go ahead with your opening remarks. All right. If it pleases the jury, members of the court... I will go ahead and prove to you that Revenge of the Sith suffers from prequel bias. This is not the terrible movie that everyone seems to think it is. Sure, it has all the uh, earmarks of a Lucasfilm, wooden acting, terrible directing, a green screen in every scene, not an actual set. We're not even sure those were real people. I To this day, I still think Natalie Portman may have been CGI, all CGI, but I I digress. That's almost every Star Wars movie, wooden acting and terrible directing here and there, terrible dialogue. These are all hallmarks of almost every Star Wars film. Revenge of the Sith isn't any different. Now, I will tell you that the reason people don't like Revenge of the Sith is mostly because everyone hated The Phantom Menace and wasn't too uh, wazooey about Attack of the Clones. And so people wanted to hate this movie. There's, it also suffers from generational bias. We're all over 30. Okay? Tom and I are the same age. We're almost 37 years old. Sean, I think, is over 30 as well. I'm Not 30 on the dot. 30 on the dot. Okay. Yeah. Generational bias, folks. Children loved those three movies and are bored by the movies we all love. So I think that people of um, Tom and I's age of that generation were always going to prefer the original trilogy to the prequel trilogy. 
And none of that has anything to do with the movie itself. I will go ahead and prove to you over the course of the next 40 minutes or so that there's really, that, that the Revenge of the Sith actually flows very nicely, that what happens to Anakin, which is one of the major complaints of this thing, that his turn to the dark side actually follows from all of what, we, what was set up in the first two movies. I will uh, explain that I was not bored with that movie, and therefore it meets my minimum criteria for good, which is I was entertained. And ultimately, isn't that what it's all about? Thank you. Tom, your opening well. remarks, sir. Yeah, you see, your opening remarks are flawed from the very start um, in the idea that every Star Wars movie suffers from green screening and bad acting, whereas Return of the Jedi actually has some of the greatest steep sets in sci-fi movies, like the opening sequence in Tatooine, the moonlit forest in Endor, where Luke reveals his secret to Leia, or the Emperor's throne room with, with the amazing lighting and space battle in the, in the windows, uh, illuminating the struggles between Luke and his father, Vader. Um, I would also add, would an acting Return of the Jedi has some of the most iconic movie quotes ever. Your thoughts betray you, your feelings for them are strong, especially for a sister. That thing's operational. So what I told you was true from a certain point of view. There's not even a single line that anyone can remember from Revenge of the Sith except Vader at the end yelling, no, in one of the, the most uncomfortable movie moments in history. So, to try to compare them on the same table is for the start. Um, but so I'll leave it there, because your, your opening remarks are just so horrible and so full of lies to compare the two that I, I can't even... I've lost my track of thinking. <laughs> okay. All right, Sean. Before we, we before we even start, do you have anything for either myself or Tom regarding Revenge of the Sith and our opening remarks? No, you know, I really don't. I mean, if if I happen to come up with a question and I do have, I do have just a few right off the bat. But actually, I think they're more about Jedi, really. Okay. Than Sith. Um, but if I come up with anything along the way, um, I will try to interject as best I'm able to, and I'll stop you, ask a question, and let you give as good as you know, as reasonable response as you can. But for the most part, um, I'm going to let you guys just kind of fly solo and just make your own cases. Okay. I want to go ahead and start with uh, the first complaint about Revenge of the Sith. Probably one of the major complaints is that is it drops you right into a jumbled mess. Um, and now, a lot of this is summed up really, really nicely in the Mr. Plinkett review, uh, Revenge of the Sith. And I'll, I'll go ahead and say I, I enjoyed that review. Um, I think, <laughs> to, to, to coin a phrase, from a certain point of view, they were right about a lot of things. But I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the things that I think were acceptable and interesting. Now, you have to remember, what they're setting up in Revenge of the Sith is it's the end of the war. The war is already happening. And now I know that, you know, in movie making, you know, it's show me, don't tell me, and you don't want to have to depend on secondary material like the entire Clone Wars cartoon series on Cartoon Network or the books or anything else like that. But the idea here is that this, the, the whole movie is supposed to be a... a the turn of Anakin into uh, Darth Vader. And, but they still have things they need to do. They need to finish the war. They need to give you, they need to give Anakin uh, things to happen so that uh, he'll have to have this conflict with himself and then make the terrible choice. So it's okay. And I think in movie making, it's also okay to drop you into uh, something right in the middle and just kind of take you on the story. And I think they do. You know, there, there's the complaint, oh, you don't know whose side is who. I don't understand how people can, can come to that conclusion. They showed you right. what... Yeah, well, clearly, clearly it was Anakin and, and Obi-Wan Kenobi versus all those other ships. No, they were, if you looked closely, there were the first imprint of the Star Destroyers, which they set up in the, fir in the second movie. So when they start building the, uh, the Republic Army, you saw what the Star Destroyers looked like. 
And in the first movie, with the Separatist Army, or whatever they were, the Trade Federation, you saw that their ships looked like, like mini Death Stars with a donut around the side of it. So those are the ships you see in this one. I don't understand where the confusion's coming from. To me, it was very easy to pick up who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. Uh, I, I do not share in that opinion whatsoever, and thought it was a jumbled mess, just like pretty much every internet reviewer has ever described it as. Uh, I don't, way. again, I don't know where you get jumbled mess from. It's very easy to see who the uh, the separatist army ships were. I, I, and, and why would, and again, in any other movie where you've got ships flying around everywhere else, I don't, I don't necessarily hear that much complaining about it. People just kind of go along for the ride, and eventually the movie slows down enough for you to focus. I actually think the long, you know, the long shot, which again is something they complain about, but the long shot of the of the Anakin and uh, Obi Wan Kenobi ship flying into the space scene is actually pretty cool to watch. And remember, these things are very visual, very visually dependent, not necessarily uh, the most plot driven of movies. They're, they've always been. Uh, sort of a, a an ode to special effects and visual excitement. And that was a visually exciting scene. You're going to sit there and tell me that was a boring scene? It looked like a jumbled mess. <sighs> it's, it's not enjoyable to watch to me at all, and nor does it explain very well how they're able to f- complete the mission they're going on or why it's so important at one point that Anakin changes his mind to go rescue a guy that wasn't even with him. Um, who fell behind. And See, then how they were able to track down the Chancellor, I, I'm not, they never really explain, other than maybe I guess they just know the ship, maybe by eyesight, I'm not really sure. Okay, number one, that's a common thing throughout the Star Wars movies, is why is this happening because the plot says so. I mean, you really want to nitpick. You can find that kind of a thing in lots of movies, including the first three Star Wars movies. Why? Because plot says. So I don't have yeah, a major sure, problem like with them. In return of the- and to compare the Return of the Jedi opening sequence, there's a very clear mission, there's a very clear bad guy, and there's a very clear plan to rescue the good guys. Okay. So let me go back it's here to Revenge of the Sith. May I, uh, very may, obvious may, who the good guys and the bad guys are. May I interject a uh, quick question? Sure. Couldn't it kind of be agreed that every single Star Wars movie, in fact, almost every single visual Star Wars property that begins with that famous opening crawl kind of sets up the objectives and the why and the initial who, what, when, and where for that matter? Yes, the first line of this thing is war. And that they were, and, and, and while it's a somewhat confusing line, there are heroes on every side, but they're basically saying, you know, it's the Galactic Republic against the Separatists, and, the, and they're fighting, and the, and the Chancellor's been kidnapped, and Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker are attempting to save him. Bam, they, and then they drop you into following their two ships into the battlefield. Well, then I would say that the combination of that and the shot, I think that's a pretty sufficient way to open up the movie. The other, so, to, to Tom's point that, you know, okay, so they don't know, so for no apparent reason they just know intrinsically that, uh, which, which is the ship that the Chancellor is on. I mean, again, they, they tell you right at the beginning of the movie, they're, they're off to find the Chancellor in the middle of this battlefield, and they're flying around. You're, I don't know why you're bringing up the complaint that he, he veers off from what they're doing to go save the pilot. I think it's, I, I think Anakin has, Made a series of dumb mistakes, very impulsive mistakes. I think that's very. I think that was a very much a, a character thing of his, which was, okay. you know, he tries to do the right thing, and he's constantly do, uh, being impulsive, and you know that that was that was the whole last movie was was him doing something impulsive uh, for the right, maybe even for the right reasons, but still being impulsive, and Obi Wan saying, "No, bad, bad Jedi, you can't do that. That's not the way things are done." He yells at him in the la- in like the last scene of the movie of Attack of the Clones, when he wants to go back and save Padme, and he's like, if you do and you disrupt the mission, you're going to get kicked out of the Order. So that, to me, is entirely consistent with Anakin's character. Okay, so we go into... Uh, so, they, so they get in there, they get into the Chancellor's ship, they get uh, to where he's being held, and... <laughs> this is fairly common, okay? And, and, and I'll give you this, 
George Lucas sometimes, I, the one thing that I've said about Revenge of the Sith is that tonally it's very confused. I actually, I think I've said that about another movie that we talked about as well, where tonally you're like, I don't, what's happening here? Um, mm. And frequently throughout the Star Wars movies, they set up this buddy cop thing where everyone's making snarky, sarcastic remarks. Han Solo does it all the time. Luke Skywalker does it all the time. I'll, I'll even go to Re- Return of the Jedi. You know, how are we doing? <laughs> where, they, where they finally get, where they finally meet up in Jabba's palace as they're, you know, handcuffed and being, you know, tossed into the Sarlacc pit. And uh, Han says, you know, how are we doing? And Luke says, same as usual. That bad, huh? I mean, that's a common thing. So, despite the fact that you know, they got their asses whooped by uh, Count Dooku in the second movie, and Anakin got his hand chopped off. It would still be consistent in the Lucas world for them to be sarcastic and snarky. So when, uh, Ch- so when the Chancellor says, you know, beware, he's a Sith Lord, you guys are in trouble here. And he says, ah, don't worry about it, uh, Sith Lords are a speciality. That's about right. <laughs> That's about right for Lucas. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I told you, I'm racing again. The entire opening sequence is a jumbled mess. Then finding the Chancellor should be near impossible. Um, and Once they're on the ship, though, did you have any problems with the actual rescue itself? Well, how, how do they know where he is? Or why is he in the, room, the perfectly convenient room that's left alone with few to no guards? And well, don't again, that Count Dooku is nearby? Don't you think, considering the Chancellor's main objective here was to... Uh, continue, continue to build trust in Anakin and to get this whole thing set up where Anakin would replace Dooku, then turn Anakin and make him his apprentice. Wouldn't you think that Chancellor would have would have gone out of his way to set that all up, make it easy for them? You can complain yeah, that maybe they made, he made it, it too from, easy. From, from, it suffers from Obi Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker being complete idiots. <laughs> <laughs> it was already established the that, they, that, that, that the Emperor was <laughs> that, that uh, Palpatine was clouding everyone's judgment. And a pretty amazing power. He not only does a cloud of judgment, but also beckon them to his direction to find him. I'm okay with that. Uh, well, I'm not. It's terrible writing. How, it's, do they go, how do they find him and not notice the quote unquote Sith Lord of Count Dooku lurking nearby? They were preoccupied. By the long walk in the empty room to the chancellor? No, adrenaline's... Oh, okay, come on. You've never been in a situation where your adrenaline's flowing and you're fighting and you're doing stuff and you're just not really thinking about all the facets of what's going on around you. You're just kind of focusing on your target objective. Come on. It's totally believable. Kenobi, uh, Kenobi has repeatedly through the first three movies shown he has zero fear of combat robots, no matter <laughs> how many there are. You know, I'm saying he was over hundreds around him. I highly um, doubt there is any adrenaline rush whatsoever. Oh, that's not true. I mean, they're running through a ship. There's got to be some adrenaline. That's biologically yeah, impossible. He, he, looked not really, he looked really nervous in the end of the Sith when he goes to fight Grievous, and he jumps into a circle of, like, 40 robots. To be fair, Thomas actually is making an interesting point about how much the writing is kind of leading to assumptions about, you know, Mark, as you pointed out, about lack of focus due to an adrenaline rush or some such thing. It's it's a fair criticism. I'm not going to say that the, that the writing in the movies is, is, is a tad lazy, but I also find that to be consistent in most of the Star Wars movies. It's just... It's, 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 it's thing, 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 and they very rarely stop to, you know, stop, uh, stop the momentum to kind of explain stuff. You just kind of you know, even in the very first movie, you know, once they got a lot of the exposition out of the way, it was thing happen, thing happen, thing happen. You know, the whole the whole Death Star sequence is just stuff happening. You know, and you're just along for the ride. That's what that's that, that's again why the nitpicky kind of the nitpickiness of this sort of bothers me because these are supposed to be adventure films, and what you're what you're watching is an adventure unfold. They, they they got on board the ship to go rescue the Chancellor. You know, and ultimately they were walking into a very very elaborate, well drawn out trap. You know, which is setting up other stuff later on in the movie. I, I'm okay with this. What else, moving on to uh, later on in the film, what other things, Tom, did you have a, a, a real problem with? I, there's nothing about the movie I find even really appetizing in any way. The entire movie is shot in front of a green screen. The, the characters are basically buffoons. The only actually redeemable performance in the entire movie is by the, the Chancellor, Ian uh, McDermott, 
everyone else is just has the wor- absolute worst dialogue. It's just a constant. Need the dialogue is great in all the other movies. I just gave you some quotes from Return of the Jedi. Give me a couple of good quotes from Revenge of the Sith. I don't. I, first of all, the quotes that you have from Return of the Jedi, half of them are retarded. <laughs> you know, they, they may be iconic and memorable, but they're also way stupid. The, the before we get, before we get to a dialogue, um, the green screen thing has been brought up a couple of times now. And while I will agree that I have seen some horrible movies that have been rooted solely, almost entirely, in green screen effects, um, one in particular comes to mind. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, Thomas, if maybe you could elaborate on the problems that the green screen causes, because quite frankly, yes, there's, there's actually there's an interview on a, in British television with. Uh, so you and McGregor goes on television show and he talks about probably you know, one of the was supposed to be one of the most important points of the tri- of the prequel trilogy, which is the actual handing off of Luke to Aunt Beru. And he can literally c- cannot even like control himself and his, his giggle fits because he's so embarrassed as an actor as to what he had to do. He walks onto a stage that's completely green. He he's asked to sit on a green box and pretend like that's an animal that he's riding. Uh, afterwards, he's supposed to cut off of the animal. So he's, and, oh, he's not supposed to rock side to side as if the animal is moving. Um, then he's supposed to figure out which side he gets off of. He, then he's given a fake baby to hand to Aunt Beru. And then someone off in the, in the crowd says, look at the moons, look at the moons. And, he, and he, it's, one of his, it's a great line to watch. It's hilarious. He's laughing. And he's just looking off into the green scene because no one even knows where he's supposed to be looking. So here you have this actor who you're assuming was paid in, paid to come for his name recognition. He's not even getting to act. There's not even a single thing on the stage for him to interact with, let alone a human being or creature, anything. That's the problem with green screen. And you can see it repeatedly through the movies as people walk in front of green screen, they sit on couches in front of green screens. As if, like, the, the cool-looking picture is moving in the background. It's supposed to, like, pull me away from the horrible dialogue. It doesn't. It just makes, it makes it more infuriating. But I would tell you that a live set, a bad acting in front of a live set or bad acting in front of a green screen is still bad acting. And the, and the Star Wars I movies have, say, have never been acted particularly well. It's always been hammy. It's always been over the top. It's been something that we've come to accept in many people... Uh, find charming about the Star Wars movies. In fact, I, I don't think there's any. I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe the dialogue from Revenge of the Sith as charming. <laughs> Again, I think it's a lot. I think it's just a lot of pent up hate, you know. But if you look at these individuals, it's bad dialogue. Even, it's bad dialogue and wooden performances, and you know, and the dialogue is romance. <laughs> and the can, dialogue and the romance between Han and Leia and Anakin and Padme. Can you tell who is the better actor with the better dialogue versus the other? I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, they actually have a love scene, you know, up on the platforms in Endor. And oh, come on. They spent an entire movie Anakin doing love scenes with Anakin and couch. Padme. Wait a minute. They spent an entire movie doing that. There wasn't, there wasn't a tremendous amount of time for it in this one, given all they had to accomplish. And they do yeah. they show they do show some moments of romance amidst war. Uh, between uh, Padme and Anakin in Revenge of the Sith, and I know this, I know the one scene that you're referring to is you know is you know like I'm so in love with you, oh, I'm so in love with you. I honestly think in part of that she was just messing with him. You know, I I, I don't think that that, that that whole thing was meant to be, um, you know, one sincere note. I think I think what she says, oh, so love has blinded you. I think she's messing with him in that. Uh, so she's just taking that moment now to be snarky which she hasn't really displayed in the rest of the movies. Well, while I don't necessarily agree with Thomas, I think that answers my question. The, the main reason I pointed out, if I, may, if I may interject a small opinion of my own, you know, granted, I will admit there's a certain authenticity that gets missed out on with green screen quite a bit, but the one movie that always comes to mind, if anybody ever makes a generality like that, says that no movie that relies heavily upon it can possibly be good, is I tend to point out, Sin City. Uh, yeah, I would I would agree. I think Sin City there, they actually realize that they can use the CGI and make it part of the ambiance of the film, whereas right. the Revenge of the Sith and the other prequels just becomes a mat backdrop to people talking. Let's uh, let's move on, Thomas, to some of the other 
some of the other complaints that you kind of that you kind of rattled off there about Revenge of the Sith. In fact, I'm going to let you kind of pick a grab bag of the out of the grab bag of the ones. I'd say the we'll go into the comparison of the final favor scenes between Return of the Jedi and Revenge of the Sith, and how just completely without emotion and feeling the end of the Revenge of the Sith is in comparison, where it's just two swordsmen just swinging swords, like, evenly matched, and nothing's really happening, just cool lavas flowing behind them, and whereas there's this emotion and rage in, in Return of the Jedi that's just, you know, where it, it, the, the force becomes more than just being really good people with swords. It, it, there's, a, there's a different element to it that comes across in the acting of the scene, and the score... And, and the actual stage work, which doesn't come across in Revenge of the Sith at all. And it's supposed to be, you know, again, one of the more important sequences of the movies. And it's just, you just, this, this sword fight gets lost in these backdrops and just doesn't have any feeling of drama. There's no gravitas to it. It's just, it's just two people f- fighting and doing somersaults and doing spins. It just, it doesn't carry any seriousness to it. So are you saying that there was perhaps a bit of a less is more value to the Return of the Jedi scene? Yeah, because in the original trilogy, they weren't supposed to be these super samurai swordsmen. That wasn't really you know, the way they were portrayed, which made the Force a little bit more interesting and intriguing. As a, as the lightsabers were more of this sort of extension to them, whereas they blow that up in Revenge of the Sith and, when, and uh, Attack of the Clones, when you have Yoda being, you know, Ninja Master Yoda doing somersaults all over the place, uh, it, it makes it just it makes the Force all about how good you are with this lightsaber. But basically, it seems like everyone in the universe is roughly at the same skill level uh, until they make a tactical error. So there's no it just doesn't carry anything to it. It's just it's just effects on the screen, people doing cool fight choreography, which is, to me wasn't what the, the original purpose in the original trilogy was. That's a that's a somewhat fair point, Mark. He talks about the force. Okay. So what what have we seen people actually do with the force other than some of the soliloquies that we get from the Empire Strikes Back out of Yoda? People get choked a lot and their minds are red and sometimes uh, their actions are controlled somewhat, and they and people have telekinesis. I understand that if you read the books and you know the comic books, and uh, you know you look at all the the non movie stuff, you can get this impression that the force is supposed to be something else. But all you ever see in the movies, and this is all of them, people getting choked, you know, tricks essentially, telepathy, telekinesis. So the fact that and that, to me, remains consistent throughout even the prequel trilogies. You see the same series of things again. The only and the only thing that I'll give the Tom in the sense of you know the prequel trilogies being so much worse and you know and really ruining things is I totally agree with everybody in the known universe that once they took the concept of the Force and made it you know instead of like a mystical thing and made it into a science thing with the midichlorians, it completely ruined it. But they don't even really address that by the third movie. It's it, they did it once they moved on from it. Everything they're doing with regards to the Force in Revenge of the Sith, they do in the fir- they do in, in uh, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. As far as the fight scenes go, you know, I watch both of them back again, and it's two different stories. So, yes, they're presented differently. In the first story, Luke is trying not to fight Vader, and at you know, and, and much like Frodo in the Lord of the Rings, you know, his mission to not turn to the dark side and bring his father back from the light, it, at, it nearly fails. And Frodo did fail, but Luke nearly fails at this. It's a good story. I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad story. But when you look at what Luke was trying to accomplish, he went in there to try to save his father. You know, the guy who blew up a planet, choked people out, and was the biggest bastard in the galaxy. Um, he went in there to not fight, and he kept being driven to, and instead of not giving in to hate, 
that's exactly what he almost does. He comes very, very close. He w- he was able to win that fight, you know, and chop off Vader's hand and be, be batter him to death with the uh, with the lightsaber, is because he's giving in to all of that anger. When he realizes that, yes, then he throws the lightsaber away, and the Emperor nearly kills him until he's saved by his father. Okay, fine. That's not the story though that we're getting in Revenge of the Sith. In Revenge of the Sith, you're getting a story that you know the culmination of uh, the, you know the teacher taking on the so the student taking on the teacher. And let's remember, you know, everyone focuses on the length of time that that fight took and, you know, and, ha- and how it was just a lot of fight choreography, you know, a mist of green screen and all of that stuff. But it's like everyone forgets the setup. So the setup to this is he's just, you know, he, he's just given himself over to the dark side. He's now sort of enjoying, you know, the fruits of finally not having to, not having to edit himself. And what does he say throughout the entire uh, first set of movies? You know, he he wants more power. He you know he feels like he's being held back. That's a major theme of Revenge of the Sith. Is this idea that Anakin feels like the Jedi Council and everybody else in the known universe is holding him back? And finally, finally, he's able to just be himself, which turns out he's a bastard. So we finally, so you know, so we get to the planet, and we get to the you know planet completely made of hot lava, Mustafa, or whatever the hell it's called. And, you know, he's thinking the one person who's going to remain true to him, the one person who's going to walk with him, just in his mind, his now warped mind, just turned her back on him. Then he sees the guy who, for the last movie, rode him, you know, like he was a horse. He thinks that, you know, he, him and, and the woman he loves has now turned on him, and he, he wants to kill him. This isn't, this wasn't trying to save him, wasn't trying to not fight him. He was out for blood. And that was what that scene was all about. He wanted, you know, he wanted to prove himself. He wanted to, you know, show the world just how powerful he was, and he needed to kill Kenobi to do it. And God knows that's what he was trying to do. The fact that they did it in a, you know, in a planet full of lava, you know, and the place is falling apart all around them, was, you know, was to add visual effect and to also show, look how powerful these guys are. They could have this fight amidst the whole world falling apart around them. To me, it looked pretty cool. Yes, it was very choreographed. Yes, it was, you know, very ninja and all that other stuff. But I think that's what adds to it. Different, it was a completely different story than, than all the other lightsaber scenes in the rest of the movies. You know, I don't have a problem with Darth, you know, Darth Vader and old Obi-Wan Kenobi in the first movie having that, you know, a couple of swipes with the sword and then, you know, and then he gives up and gets hit with the lightsaber. I don't, that's a different story, different set of circumstances. I'm okay with that. But I think people unfairly criticize that whole fight scene because of the comparison, where they're not the same story. It was two different stories between Revenge of the Sith and Return of the Jedi in terms of those lightsaber battles. Okay. Well, I think that pretty much hits all the points of that one. And now, in turn, Mark, I'm going to let you pick from the various list of grievances that Thomas raised and choose which one it is that you want to address next. Um, I will remind you that, hang on just to take care, I'm going to look at the stopwatch. Uh, We are currently sitting at 33 minutes and as of now, 30 seconds. So we have about 12 minutes and change. Okay. The last Uh, one I want to hit on is Anakin's turn before we flip over to Return of the Jedi. And boy, do I got complaints about that now. But I want to talk about Anakin's turn. To the dark side, people felt like it was rushed. People felt like, um, you know, I think Tom and correct me if I'm wrong. Tom felt like it was rushed. It wasn't believable. It doesn't help that Hayden Christensen seems to struggle with with, with it. But I, you know, but as I watched it again uh, the other day, the struggle I actually, with acting. <laughs> I don't think Hayden Christensen is bad in everything he does. Let's not be haters here. Um, but I feel like. If you if you really watch the first two movies and you see the kind of character that they're setting up, I'm okay with how fast this goes because it's not really fast. This is the culmination of a lot of different things. It's everything I just said before about the lightsaber scene. It was you know, and he says it in this movie. They actually do take some time. People are like oh, it's boring. It's people talking. Well. It's not just people talking. Dialogue is important in a movie, last time I checked, especially when people complain so much about the visual aesthetic of a movie, you know, and it, you know, blowing everything else out of the water. There's actually moments in this movie where the dialogue is really important. So let's go, let, 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 let's go to the thing that sets us all off, right? Uh, he thinks Padme's going to die in childbirth. 
and he's scared to death of this, and he doesn't want this to happen. He's going to do anything he can to make sure it doesn't happen. And the first person he goes to is one of his supposed mentors, is Yoda. And Yoda tells him something he doesn't want to listen to. This is common. This is common in people. <laughs> this is it's why I don't do therapy anymore. This is common in characters in this movie. This is common with Anakin Skywalker. So Yoda says to him, you know, you need to let go of this. There's nothing you, there's really, you, know, nothing you can do about it. Don't get so caught up in, in these visions you see of the future. And he doesn't want to hear that. He wants to do something. He always wants to do something. That's just what drives him. He wants to do. He wants to fix. So, you know, so he gets pissed. This is yet another reason why he's frustrated with the Jedi. He doesn't get the answers that he wants. Meanwhile, Palpatine's slowly seducing him and saying, hey, you know, I've got ideas, I've got things we can do, you know, and he's, you know, and he's starting to get somewhere with somebody. And so you finally get to, you know, and then there's these, you know, the questions of, you know, what's the Jedi Council's real motivation versus Palpatine's motivation, and, and, and that's why I say it's, it's very believable that he would go ahead and say, you know what, I, I may not like everything this guy's doing, but it's still better than what they're doing. Totally logical conclusion, based on everything he's done in the past. Totally logical that he would, you know, come to realize. And I, and I go back to the second movie on this one, Attack of the Clones, where he's talking about, well, maybe you know there should be uh, a ruler in place who can just make sense of things and keep and, and keep things organized, and you know we can have rule of law in the in, in the galaxy instead of you know the mess of democracy, which it, which was supposed to foreshadow all of this. So is it again any wonder? that when faced with a, a council of people who he doesn't respect anymore, and it, and it feels like it's holding him back anyway, and then a guy comes along and says, unlimited power, walk this way. And finally, after two movies of saying that's exactly what he wants, he's getting it, and then people wonder why he turned. Nope, to me, completely consistent. Okay, well stated. Thomas, go ahead and defend your stance. Well, let's let's put, again. We're gonna go back into the actual actor of Hayden Christensen. I just want to read a quote of his, you know, which shows how bad the movies are. And he talks about quote how these movies are made is very specific as far as what our jobs are. George was looking for us to come in, and have script meetings with him, and talk about characters. It wasn't necessarily anything you could feel good about creatively, 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 as far as this is why he became an actor. It's not why you become an actor to do stuff like Star Wars. I mean, this, so this is your your main lead. This is the guy that drives your prequels, and he doesn't even like the movies. He's he's not he doesn't think he got a chance to be an actor. He was given terrible dialogue. He he had to buy into the the premise that he didn't realize that his that Anakin couldn't pick up the fact that the Chancellor was actually a Sith Lord, a Sith Lord they had been looking for for two movies even though he seemed to know a whole heck of a lot about Sith history. Um, and just, again, it goes into the having to suspend all this belief that, that Anakin is so stupid that he just doesn't notice how evil the Chancellor is. He doesn't get a sense of him. He he doesn't seem to question his his knowledge of things that he has no reason to know about, considering he's not even a Jedi or even a Force user of any, in any way. Um, but I'm just going to buy into all this just because I want to watch the slow corruption of him becoming into Anakin. It's just, it's poor writing. Um, I mean, it gets, it gets the point across he's slowly corrupted. He's just corrupted because he's an idiot, as far as I can tell. But, you know, and that's the, what the purpose of the Anakin character is, the, the savior of the Force. I think it fails in that. Um, Mark, I have a question okay. for you. Um, since you've likened this to a Lincoln-Douglas debate, allow me to pose something that waxes perhaps just a bit philosophical about something you brought up repeatedly. You've noted consistently that these various flaws that Thomas has brought up, and some of them arguably, you've and you've admitted yourself, are indeed flaws, are simply, as you put it, consistent with the series. Does it necessarily make something... Does, is consistency necessarily good if it's something that's consistently weak, though? The reason why I bring it up and I, and I say, well, it's consistent, is 
You either like the Star Wars movies or you don't. My wife fell asleep on almost all of them and made herself stay awake for The Phantom Menace because, you know, it was Valentine's Day last year and she wanted to make me happy. But, you know, there's somebody who doesn't like these movies. I like these movies. Tom likes these movies, or at least half of them. You, you, either, you can either appreciate them flaws and all, or you, you just don't like the damn movies. You know, you you know, if you sit, look, there were people who watched the original Star Wars movies back in 1979 and thought, well, that was dopey but fun, and probably didn't watch any of the rest of them, or so, or so maybe a couple of them were like, yeah, I'm kind of over this. I think to love a Star Wars movie is to love it warts and all, to love the poor direction, to love the wooden acting. To love the fact that George Lucas seems to do much better with special effects than he does with actual, actually directing people. You know, that's all part of the charm. And it's different levels for, for different movies. You know, they weren't... Lumping Return of the Jedi into these same flaws that Revenge of the Sith has, and it just doesn't have them. It doesn't have the, the overwhelming green screen feel to it. There's numerous stage sets. They're in the but woods. I'm not so they're caught in up desert. in that as you are. They're in, they're in the, but you're, you're saying that they all have these same inconsistencies and problems, but they don't. I'm Revenge talking about with, like, with regards to the acting. With dialogue, with, with good acting, with memorable spoken scenes, which Revenge of the Sith has not. Okay, I've already said that I thought the acting in Revenge of the Sith, in, in Return of the Jedi, rather, was hammy. In times it was over the top. The dialogue has never been good in a Star Wars movie, ever, 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 ever. Some actors handle it better than others, but it's I, all pretty I bad. I strongly disagree that the the dialogue of Revenge of the Return of the Jedi is anywhere near the what was in Revenge of the Sith, and five, well, far more of the scenes in Return of the Jedi. I don't. I can't think of this. I guess before I'd actually describe a single memorable dialogue-driven scene in Revenge of the Sith, and weren't able to even come up with one. But again, catchphrases and one-liners doesn't make dialogue good. Maybe it's memorable. It works uh, I, in pro I, wrestling. I, would, I know. I, the entire final scene of Return of the Jedi, where, where they're discussing redemption and threats against his, his family, there, there's power in that scene, in that dialogue, that is just that you can't compare to Ewan McGregor yelling out, I have the high ground. Don't come up here. That's not, they're, they're not the same. They're, they're not the same. They were different. I keep saying they were different stories. And I've got the high ground. Don't do it. And him doing it anyway tells you a lot about both of those characters. Tells you a lot about what was happening in that scene. He, you know, Anakin pr wanting to prove beyond a shadow of doubt he was the most powerful Jedi and failing at it. I think that I, I, I actually think that was a good conclusion to his story. That he basically that, had to that, be rebuilt. That's the last, that's the last words. I, I'm, I, I think uh, I, I think we're we're pretty much done with this, Tom. It was. I mean, you pretty much stated uh, your case, right? Is there, do you feel like you have anything else you need to say about it? Because you know, I could sit here for the next hour and defend every scene in that movie, um, but we, you know, we keep coming back to kind of the same theme. So I just want to make sure that you've had your say. Is there anything else you want to complain about? Revenge no, I think I've. I've vilified Revenge of the Sith as much as I feel necessary. It is now time to get into talking to the original trilogy and trilogy ender Endor and Ewoks and Jabba. Oh my! Um, uh, we are going to flip it and reverse it this time. So, Thomas List, go ahead with your opening arguments in favor of Return of the Jedi. Uh, Return of the Jedi has numerous excellent qualities about it. The, the stories of all the main characters come into a full arc. They all mature in front of your eyes from the first trilogy to the last. You actually have notable villains like Jabba the Hutt, um, the Emperor, Vader himself. Um, you have some of the classic quotes of the Star Wars franchise that are non-existent in the original tril in the prequel trilogy. You have uh, the battle scene, even the final scene, there's this amazing opera of, of three separate battle sequences all happening simultaneously and keeping the viewer engaged. I, it's just the mysticism of the Jedi and, and Return of the Jedi and the Force and 
the evolution of Luke Skywalker. It's just and that there's just a, there's a real character arc from him become, becoming the whiny farm boy to the Jedi Master that makes the whole original trilogy w- worth watching. That it's just absent in, in Revenge. Um, you have the, the saving of the friends, the plans. Uh, just there's uh, I can't other than some sort of weak scenes with with Ewoks, which I don't even think are that weak to begin with. I, I don't even see many flaws in Return of the Jedi. It's, it's, it's as close to being my second, probably my second favorite after Empire, but it's not far behind because of the way things were shot and the, the realness of, of the stage sets and the dialogue. Some well said points. Well said. And Mr. Rodlich, your rebuttal. All right. Tom and I, when we were setting up this uh, podcast yesterday, he's like, you know, I have a challenge for you. If I take away Ewoks, what do you have to complain about? Because admittedly, when we first had this argument, and again, this is all based on a conversation that was had right after uh, we had seen Revenge of the Sith. You know, and I said over and over and over again my line about a legion of the emperor's best troops taken out by Care Bears. Now, look, I- I'm going to get to that at some point, but I'm going to take Tom up on his challenge. And I rewatched Return of the Jedi yesterday, and I'm going to proceed to argue my point without having to reference the Ewoks until the very end, if I have to at all. Um, first of all, there are time consistencies with this movie that are severely, I should say time inconsistencies in this movie that throw it completely out of whack. There are issues with the end of The Empire Strikes Back and the beginning of Return of the Jedi that just don't make any sense. The whole opening sequence, you want to talk about an opening sequence that's a, that's a jumbled mess? The whole opening rescue of Han Solo from Java's Palace is like the ECW tag team opening medley in a pay-per-view. Okay, remember when the tag teams would start, you'd start with two, and then one of them would hit a finisher, and then you'd hear music, and another tag team would run out, and then it was rinse, repeat two or three times until you had a big schmoz, and it would all blow up in the end, and then you would move on to the next match. Remember that? Remember the old ECW opening medley? Yes, that's what this was like, okay? It was... And I don't want to get to this more, more at length, but I'm just doing an overall. This is for a nonsensical uh, mess of a rescue that was not necessarily meant to be so. It was essentially meant to get all the characters in the same place at the same time and then have a big fight. And it has all kinds of problems with it. That's why I laugh when people compare this to Revenge of the Sith. If you want to call that a big mess, so was Jabba's Palace. Um there are I mentioned the time inconsistencies with regards to to uh, some of the characters it's also with regards to the Death Star I mean I think my biggest problem with Return of the Jedi and this is going to go a little outside of the just focus on the pictures realms is that there was never really meant to be anything past A New Hope A New Hope was the end of George Lucas's story the story was supposed to be you know the beginning of Anakin to his redemption and it was Anakin's story uh, and he starts in the middle. This is a very famous story about how Star Wars came to be. And the end of it's supposed to be the Death Star blowing up. But then it got, but you know, but because he starts in the middle, and then, then the thing makes tons of money, they have to go and make sequels. And so by the time they get to the third movie, they're like, well, let's just do it again. And that's exactly what it feels like. The whole issue with the Death Star just felt tacked on, felt rushed, doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense, all of it. And... You know, it, it seems like it was just written in there so that they could redo the ending of the first movie. Um, yes, there's the Ewoks, and again, again, I will explain that. You know, it, one last thing about kind of going outside of the script is if you know what was intended to be Return of the Jedi and then what he throws away and replaces it with for uh, for what we then see as Return of the Jedi, you, you realize just how dumbed down it is and how cockamamie it becomes. And I don't want to, and, for, you know, for people who don't know, you know, the urban legends, I guess, about how Lando Calrissian was supposed to die and the Millennium Falcon was supposed to blow up, you know, and it was supposed to be Wookiees and not Ewoks. It, it, you know, it's kind of like what Tom was saying about the first movie where, you know, about uh, Revenge of the Sith, it's just like, you know this is supposed to be better than this. 
and it's hard for me to even watch it now, realizing that you know Lucas just took a hatchet job to it. For, for what reason, I don't know. Um, probably to sell more toys. But those are sort of just my, my bare bones complaints about Return of the Jedi. And when, when, when we get rolling here, I can get into some of the specific problems with this thing. Let, let me just also say that if you want to go line for line, you know, word for word in Return of the Jedi, a lot of those, quote, uh, classic quotes from that movie are really stupid. Just watching, what, what, you know, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford does an okay job with his, but Mark, Jesus Christ, Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher do the best job they can. But to me, they're as comparable as Hayden Christensen and and um, Natalie Portman. They're just struggling with the material. That last part is a bold statement, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure. But I'm sure we'll get to that because you said that you wanted to take Thomas up on his challenge and you wanted to exercise your laundry list of complaints about Return of the Jedi, so here we are, and we're just going to take them point by point, as we did with Thomas's grievous, grievous ah, grievances with Revenge of the Sith. Um, so, Mark, go ahead. Make your first point. Your first okay. non-Ewok point. All right. So let's talk about the opening ECW medley. <laughs> did you like that reference, by the way? Love it. Absolutely love it. I never really thought of it that way. So, he, on the one hand, so, so let, let, let's set this up. At the end of The Empire Strikes Back, let, let's even go back a little bit further. Han Solo was a smuggler. He had a, he had a shipment of spice on the Millennium Falcon. He got boarded by the Empire. He had to dump the spice. Now he owes his benefactor money, right? He owes him money for the delivery he never delivered. Job of the Hut, right? They set this up all in A New Hope. Um, despite the fact that he, got, he gets his reward money at the end of that movie, he stays in the rebellion and never goes back to Jabba to pay him off. Um, they go to the second movie. They go to the second movie. He still hasn't paid Jabba off. By the end of the second movie, he's frozen in carbonite and taken back to Jabba uh, as the payment on a debt. Right? If you're in Jabba's shoes... Now, Jabba's supposed to be a quote-unquote villain, fine, whatever, huts are villains, vile gangster, I get it. But up to this point, what did Jabba do wrong? Other than he's a drug dealer. I mean, so, you would, if you're in Jabba's shoes, you're understandably a little pissed that this smuggler, this scum, uh, didn't pay him back. So he finally, you know, he, he's imprisoned in carbonite, he's hanging on the wall, and that's where we, we start with Return of the Jedi. Which, mind you, they don't tell you how long it is after the end of The Empire Strikes Back, but it couldn't have been that long. Mark Hamill ain't that much older. And if you go and you read the book, Shadows of the Empire, it's about a year. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly certain Return of the Dead Eye takes place a year after the, the end of The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, and in that time... Uh, say what? Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. So it's a year later. So in a year, Luke became exponentially more powerful. Uh... But so so ne never wait, mind wait, that wait, for a second. Well, let me go with it. For, I'm, I'm confused. Are you saying that we should have more sympathy for the job of the Hut character? Yes, actually, no. I think it's understandable that he would be a angry at the at you know with Han Solo and unwilling to give him up, considering the guy ran out on a debt basically. But ha hmm. hang on, because I because I want to link two things. I wish I had more sympathy for. Uh, General Grievous in his heart condition, as you know. I think you should. I think a heart, heart condition problem. is a very serious thing. Yeah, but, I uh, wish. I wish I had given him more sympathy that he had earned. You know, everything is from a certain point of view. Ha ha ha! One of your one of your crazy lines there. Yeah, one of the most iconic lines in movie history. Well, from a certain point of view, Jabba the Hutt is a sympathetic character. He did nothing wrong. Han ran out in a debt for him, and he was collecting on his debt. End of story. He even gave the guy a second chance, if you'll recall. So I want to hear nothing about no job of the hut. Now listen. So besides this, so where we were to ignore as the audience the fact that he has a sarlacc pit in the back where he frequently murders his enemies. You don't find that out number one until later. And this is and hang on, I'm getting there because frankly they all deserved it. Okay, okay, they all deserved it. What, 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 they all got you know the, what they were going to get what was coming to them. But hang on. So I said this takes place a year later, right? Now if you look at the end of Revenge of the Sith where they've got the, you know the plans with the Death Star, 
It's 20 years later, okay? It's 20 years later, about 18, 20 years, right, where uh, the events of a New Hope pick up. And the thing still isn't operational. They only get the laser online halfway through the movie, and then they go immediately and blow up Alderaan. It took them 20 years to build that battle station, and at the end of Revenge of the Sith, they only had the frame up. They blew that sucker up, and the events in Return of the Jedi are, I think, four years after the Battle of Yavin, one year after the end of The Empire Strikes Back. You're telling me that in one to four years they were able to halfway accomplish what they couldn't get accomplished in 20 years? Well, I'm not really arguing that point right now. I thought we were arguing about the sympathetic character of John of the Hutt. Uh, I think we should spend hours talking about, you know, that people don't know the pain of John of the Hutt. But what I'm saying is... You know what's really crazy in 20 years? How we used to use a rotary phone... And now I'm talking on a cell phone. It wasn't four okay. years, though. Let, let's let's keep things on topic because initially, Mark, your point was about the ECW style schmas. Yes, that's, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I want, but I wanted to link those two things because it's, they're both they're, they're two things that happened at the beginning of this movie. One, it's this Death Star that's almost operational in exponentially faster time than the first one got put together. But, but okay, so I've established that. So back down to the ECW opening medley. Okay, so in a year's time, right, Han Solo's hanging on the wall. They've got Lando in his Clark Kent Superman disguise. Okay, I don't know. No one in Jabba's palace knows who Lando is, apparently, even though that he's known among the smuggler circles, known among bounty hunters, is still Billy D. Crystal. He doesn't. She, uh, I don't know. Billy D. Billy D. Williams. Sorry, Billy, Billy Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> Billy D. Williams. Could you imagine? Billy D. Williams. Colt forty five. Okay, but he's got his. You know, it would be equivalent to eyeglasses as a disguise, and no one seems to know that that's him. Okay, fine. He's in that year's time has infiltrated Jabba's palace, and he's he's there ahead. So then they send in the first tag team, which is R two D two and C three PO. Because this is all the, this is all apparently an elaborate setup, so they can get everybody in there to rescue Han. Except it goes off the rails almost immediately because the next tag team that comes down is Chewbacca and Boosh, who is Princess Leia. We find out. Now, now let's just start with Princess Leia for a moment. I'm led to believe that she goes and she threatens this guy. She comes in and she says, "I've got this Wookie. What do you got for me?" What pay me for this Wookiee? And he says, I'm going to pay you this much. She says, well, I want this much. Well, he says, well, you're only getting this much. And she says, well, fuck you. I'm going to blow the place up. And he goes, huh, I like you. No. What should have happened was, in, in, in the real world, in a world where any of that made sense, I mean, Sean, I walk into your house and say, pay me money. I don't want to pay you money. Well, fuck you. I'm going to blow up your house then. You might talk me down from blowing you up, and then as soon as I turn around, shoot me. Boba Fett's right there, Right. All these bounty hunters are right there, these ruthless killer bounty hunters, and no one takes a shot at this idiot? Come on. You re- am I really going to believe that you know, a guy sits there with a bomb in his hand and says, I'm going to blow the place up unless you do what I say, and everyone goes, hey, you're my kind of person. Let's forget about the fact that you just almost murdered us all, you crazy bastard. No, I, I don't buy it, number one. But it gets even better because they go ahead and they say, okay, fine, we're, we're good with this. <laughs> take Chewbacca into the dungeon. Explain to me what the point of having Chewbacca in the dungeon is, then, if he's supposed to help out in the rescue. But wait, it gets, it gets to be even better. Because instead of now waiting for Luke to show up, she apparently decides... Because what, which is it? Is it everyone needs to get there and then rescue Han? Or she was just sent in by herself, at which point, what was the point of bringing Chewbacca to lock him in a dungeon? What was the elaborate I, plan? I will not tolerate the Chewbacca defense in my court. <laughs> In, de- in my defense, Ozzy once snorted a line of ants. Now look, um, I would. But I mean, do you see what I'm saying here? This whole thing doesn't make any sense to me. Either they're all there to rescue Han, or they just kept sending in person after person to try to get him rescued, and they kept botching it. Because what she does? Because instead of waiting and keeping the damn helmet on, and you know, making sure that her cover isn't blown like Lando, uh, aka Superman. She takes the helmet off, she unfreezes him, and this is, I gotta get you out of here. Why? Why do you do have to get him out of here right at that time? You don't have Chewbacca, you don't have Lando, it's the middle of the freaking night, and they pull back a curtain and catch you anyway. Either Leia's the stupidest person on Earth, didn't remember what the plan was, or all, that's awfully convenient. Awfully convenient and elaborate, I, I, because the next tag team that comes in is Luke Skywalker. And I love this. Yeah, I, 
I think you're missing the intricacies of the plan, which is that it's not possible for Luke Skywalker to rescue them from Jabba's palace. And his only chance of rescuing them is to expedite them being brought out to the Sarlacc pit and being outside where the actual the numbers come closer to favoring them. Everything that happened leading to that point... They couldn't get Leia on the skiff in her... Well, they couldn't get Leia on the skiff in her boosh outfit? Um, well, the goal would be to, to rescue all of them, not just Leia, not just Han, not just Chewie. So why is she surprised Lando. when, they, the when they're, they're caught? all outside. So, but then why, are they surpri- why is she surprised when they're caught? She's like, I gotta get you out of it's here, a, and then she's cut off, and she's like, shit, res- we're caught. It's a rescue plan. No, if she, if the idea was to unfreeze him, and and, and the other yeah. thing that you're missing then is then which foreshadow which expedites him having to now be killed by Sarlacc pit execution. No, no, I get that, but the, but I don't understand what any of her motivations are and the chance that she's taking, Tom. I mean, you want to talk about because lazy writing? If he does, if she doesn't defrost him, he doesn't go to the Sarlacc pit. No, no, I get that. What well, I'm saying is where the rescue is to happen, where everything yeah. is set up for the rescue to happen, and she couldn't leave the helmet on. You know, they, they could have, they, without revealing who she was. I mean, that that's my problem with all of this. Is I, what, I what Princess Leia does in that scene doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I get what you're saying is like, oh well, this was all an elaborate scheme to get them all brought out to the Sarlacc pit. But I don't even know if that's yeah, if that's necessarily the case. You're, you know, it's never really revealed what the overall plan was. You're just kind of along for the ride, kind of like the opening of Revenge of the well, Sith. You're I along mean, for I, a ride. I, I, I'd argue that R two D two being on top of the skip with a lightsaber to shoot at Luke um, sort of denotes that there was a plan in mind. But, but that again, but that's awfully dependent on everybody being in the right place at the right time. What's the, but uh, like I said, how does he that's know the job is to kill her? So, that's what makes what? the scene so exciting is that these friends are risking their lives for each other. No, no, no. no. Know there's how does, he, how does Luke know when he comes can. up with this, el- hang on, how does Luke know when he comes up with this elaborate scheme that puts all of his friends in danger, mind you, that Jabba just doesn't shoot Leia right then and there, and Han. I he mean, doesn't, but he, it's the only possible, it's the no only way. possible plan. That's what, makes the, that's what makes the scene have drama. No, they, that the, wasn't the only possible plan. They could have taken up, they could have taken Luke a small... Skywalker can, I mean, Luke Skywalker can't sneak into Jabba's palace like a ninja and, and put Han Solo and Carbonate on his back and sneak out. Well, here's another alternative. The they could have shown up with a band of reward. They could have they could have shown up with a band of rebels and just taken the place. This being an evil gangster and all with a bunch of criminals in the place, it would have, it would have actually made a little bit more sense. It just while it while they were while they were in the middle of a war, they were going to go attack one of the most powerful crime lords in the universe. Why not? More, in more for standing behind consistency, I would point out to you that throughout this entire series, we never have exactly a established that Luke is the brightest crayon in the box. <laughs> no, apparently... No, he frequently shows that he's likes to throw himself into a fight. He's, he's ridiculously brave to the point of getting himself into problems, which is probably why he thought this plan was such a great idea. Hey, what do you know? Like father, like son. Yeah, that's what I'm there saying. Anyway, the whole, as, as I've said... It's, the whole thing is way too convenient. It's way too dependent on people being exactly where he needs them to be. And it's also dependent on villains not acting like villains. There are several you're, points in that entire that sequence where all of them should have been killed well before Luke even gets there. But then Luke, but I, but I love how Luke's, Luke's approach to things. Luke walks in and says, bargain with me or die. Well, Luke walks up into this guy's house and says, do what I say or I'm killing everybody. Again. And then we yeah, wonder why John is pissed. Engaging the bad guy to bring them all out to the Sarlacc pit. The natural conclusion they all expected. What if he had just said, okay, you win. You win, Jedi. I'll take the droids. Bye. Because <laughs> of the Hutt like to kill people via Sarlacc pit. So he didn't just yeah, go how do you know that? What do you, how do you know that wasn't a major inconvenience? The guy's running a criminal empire. Like, he has time to deal with these fucking terrorists who are in this place, you know, me- me- messing up his day. I mean, you know, he was driven to the point of rage because of all these idiots. But along the way, again, why didn't he? Why didn't he say, "I'll take the droids"? Fine, you know, you can have him back. More trouble than he's worth. Or how about pay me my money and you can have him? I don't buy the redemption stuff at all. I really don't. I watched that again, and I've seen 
again, it's all written for convenience. People love to say that about the prequel movies. You know, why is it happening? Because plot says so. But so is everything that happens with Luke and Vader. So his whole wanting to, you know, I'll, and, and God help me. If you watch A New Hope and you look at the ages of Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill and what they're portrayed to be in those movies, how the fuck do you come up with their twins? How? That was written solely for the convenience of having, an, of having something to drive Luke crazy, because essentially he's an orphan that was raised by his uncle, but the, you know, and, so, and he's willing to sacrifice himself. So they needed to come up with something convenient for the Emperor to mess around with him with. So they gave are him you, a twin you, sister. Are you mad at all TV and movie entertainment where people that are siblings don't exactly look alike? No, it's not, Tom. There were like ten years between them, and then suddenly they were the same age. That's well, almost that as bad as Anakin because, and Padme. That could also be because Carrie Fisher was a drug user and probably aged a little quicker than she was supposed to. And like Mark sure. Hamill had an accident with his face. What my point is that you know, one's a senator and one's a senator and one's barely you know old enough to join the military. Come on, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. And it was again, it was written solely for convenience. But never mind all that. Then we have you know I sense the good in you. Tell me where you sense the good in this guy when he's killing everybody you know that doesn't do what he says in his Imperial Navy when he's blown up a planet when you know when when he's trying to either turn you to the dark side or kill you nope somewhere in there because of your crazy Jedi powers that you got two weeks ago you somehow sense the good in him again written because they had to re basically write the entire third act of the first movie so that he does get redeemed I, it's, it's, and again, a lot of this stuff that you're saying is so greatly acted or whatever, it, I, I just felt like it was a reach. I felt like a lot of the stuff between, uh, between Hamill and uh, um, George, uh, Earl Jones, James Earl Jones, just, just you know, the two actors doing the best they could with, with just some... Rid- well, would you would, uh, see, before you would argue that Anakin um, did good in the prequels, no? Did he did everything he'd do in the, in the prequels? Were they all evil acts, or did most of them actually have a root in goodness? Was his trying to save his his wife as she was going to die in childbirth the the act of someone who was being maniacally evil, or someone who had at his core, you know, some goodness? He just couldn't accept her fate. But it, it, the act itself of trying to save her was good. In the There's prequels, he does. About him, about it. In the prequels, he does. But even Obi Wan Kenobi says he's more machine now than man. And again, along the way, that that man has committed a lot of murder. <laughs> you know, just I just it it's not. I, I feel like the idea that there's still good in him that was worth redeeming is so far buried and written so, and written just as a matter of convenience without showing. You know, if they had if they had shown some compassion in Vader, even in this movie. Even up to because even if you watch the whole like uh, the whole thing with Luke going on to the Death Star, and as soon as he walks in, he's like, "I've realized now that you're my father, and it's time for us to you know to you know I can bring you back." And he's like, "It's too late for me." And then he like threatens him with a lightsaber, and he was like, "You have no idea what you're getting into, kid. You're doomed." But, but you see, way. you're making you're actually making your own counterpoint. It's the very fact that Vader doesn't kill him instantly is what shows that Anakin still has some good left inside of him that he's not. It has nothing to do with it. He was bringing him to the Emperor because that's what the Emperor. No, no, no. The Emperor said, bring him to me. When he comes to you, bring him to me. He was following orders. So that's why he didn't kill him in Empire, and that's why he didn't kill him in Return of the Jedi. In Return of the Jedi, he do- in Return of the Jedi he doesn't kill him because he's bringing him to the Emperor, and then he never and then he tries to, and Luke ends up doing damage to him. He weakened Vader's resolve by pointing out that there was still good in him, and that he was still able to be saved. The only thing I'm willing to give you is the switch he sees. You know, at the very end of the movie, where the where the you know nothing they've done has worked up to this point. Luke is a stubborn is a stubborn sob as he should be, and the Emperor proceeds to then kill him or attempt to, and then you see him with the struggle, and so we're right back to where we were when you know when he turned the first time is is the conflict. Okay, that made a little bit more sense to me. But everything else leading up to that point is, I think, Luke grasping at straws. And I'm sorry, the scene in before he even goes up to the command ship with Leia on Endor, as he's trying to reveal, my, I love this, you know, <laughs> my force is stronger than my family. I've got it, my father's got it, my sister has it. And looks at Leia, and Leia goes, I know, 
I've always known. What? How do you, did you did you know when you guys were tonguing on Hoth? Come on, and everyone makes fun of that. <laughs> they they know because of the force. Then okay, and I'm gonna. Then everything you said in the first half of this podcast was my answer to that. Okay, they know because of the force. They knew where Palpatine was because of the force. Right, but they didn't know where Dooku was. No, they knew who were, they, they they knew where he was. They knew he was on the I mean, ship because of the force. And I told you they were distracted trying to get the guy out of there. I, I mean, I would argue in the real world, twins are known to have a a sense of a shared emotional connection with their siblings. So I'd imagine if you enhance that. First word she says to him when she meets him the first time, "Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper?" Where was the Where was the sense of knowing who your twin was then? Come on. Yeah, five I, years have passed since then. They've gotten to get to know each other a little bit better. Yes, yeah. and lots of kissing in between. Yes, one quick kiss scene. Nope, two. She kisses him when when she's rescuing him from the Death Star. I bet, and I would bet she would have kissed him more in the second movie if uh, it, you know if Han and her had sw- Han and Luke had switched roles. If Han had been the one going to Dagobah for no apparent reason, and <laughs> and Luke was the one w- with her uh, in the asteroid field, I bet there would have been more kissing then too. But that's just not the way it was written. I'm telling you, the twin thing was a tacked on thing at the end to give Luke I'm, a reason. I'm aware of the actual background of the story and that, but nothing that happens in in the Endor scene it doesn't make a difference. It's still a good scene, and it's still twins, the one twin recognizing that the other is actually her sibling. It's not and then realistic. The, and then, of course, you know, and this is, this is a minor quibble because it's written, you know, it's an after-the-fact quibble, but, Leia, tell me about your mother. Well, she was sad. And I love Sean's remark when I made it. When I, when I came up with this, we talked about this during the Paranormal Activity Podcast. No, Leia, you're thinking of dead. <laughs> Um, guys, the uh, the connection to the initial topic that Mark brought up is growing rather thin, as incestastic as this <laughs> as this has been. Um, so I will ask you to, in fact, at this point, uh, please uh, wrap up this particular topic and Mark, it's time to move on to either your next one or onto the Ewoks. In the interest of time, because I feel like I've made a rather strong case for the jury to consider. I will now go with the most obvious one, and and I'm going to do this really, really short because people have talked about it for years. It's the one that everyone knows, and it's the most obvious, retarded thing about this movie. And to me... Hang on on a second. And cover your ears now. (laughs) I have a friend who will take the Ewok shit personally. (sighs) Let me let me let me put it to you this way. If I were to take a tabby cat and a marine and put them in a room and said fight, Sean, who wins? Who wins? John the tabby Cena? cat or the marine? John Cena? <laughs> An actual marine. Oh <laughs> um Ted DiBiase? You know the answer is the marine. Stop stop horsing around. <laughs> Hey, at least I didn't try to throw Randy Orton out there. Okay, if I if oh, I throw, Randy. if I take you know a Navy SEAL and put him in, in combat armor and give him weapons, weapons to kill, and I put him in there with a bear cub, maybe he takes some damage. But guess what's going to happen? The bear cub is dead meat. This is why I have such a huge problem with that. Uh, the, the, you know, people get all crazy about the politics of Revenge of the Sith. Oh, it's a, it's a metaphor for the Iraq War. What was that supposed to be? Ah, yes, it was, it was Drago versus Rocky. It was nature versus the machine. Uh-huh. It was small bears able to take out space marines. The Family Guy actually summed this up per- perfectly. It's you know you, they 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 show the guy in the stormtrooper outfit and he's being just run through with arrow after arrow and he yells out, "This armor is useless. Why do we even wear it?" Have you ever watched Return of the Jedi and watched as they're hit with rocks, rocks? Okay, these guys are wearing battle armor, helmets. They're supposed to be trained Marines, basically, space Marines. And they're hit with rocks, and they fall down, you know, like they're Charlie Chaplin. I, I don't buy any of this, okay? I, and I'll quote the emperor here, and I will rest my case for, in the interest of time. They were a legion of his be- – now, how big's a legion, right? They were a legion of his best troops 
guarding the uh, the array for the deflector shield, the generator. And when the bears, the small bears with the sticks and the rocks, decided randomly to follow C-3PO into war, they were beaten by the bears with the sticks and the rocks. Mind you, the Rebel Alliance couldn't beat them, okay? The Rebel Alliance was run from planet to planet to planet, and this was a last-ditch attempt to try not to be massacred by the giant uh, planet-blowing-up laser in space. I know, I just mangled English language on that one. Go with me here. Okay, last-ditch attempt, but the Empire had kicked their ass from one end of the galaxy to the other, with few exceptions, but the bears took them out. The bears. No, sir. Uh, bears, not bears, not bears, not bears. That's, that's George Lucas going, look, isn't nature wonderful? Look, uh, nature defeats the machine. Good triumphs over evil. It doesn't work that way. And I rest my case. Okay. Uh, well, now comes the interesting part where I get to hear Thomas defending Ewoks. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty weak case to stand on, considering it wasn't like the Ewoks were holding their own versus the Empire before the Rebel Alliance showed up. Uh, in fact, they were pretty much not involved. Um, however, with the aid of an actual paramilitary force who had their own Marines and their own Navy SEALs, were actually able to use the native combatants to supplement their own skills in taking up the deflector base. I don't know what they even remember what they called this. Um, and, and neither of the two of them could have accomplished it without the other. So it was a collaboration. Um, obviously, the Empire did not think that those woodland creatures would ever be able to resist them on their own. However, obviously, they did not expect the Rebel Alliance to find the place and to then team up with the Ewoks to leap to eventually defeat them. Um, but I would say this, uh, I think this goes without saying that there are a lot of cases in history where primitives have, have defeated... You're really going to compare the Ewoks to Native Americans? Well, well, hang on. Let, 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 let him finish. Let him finish. You, you've been using psychology to your advantage and your academic knowledge, and now he's referring to history. So go on. I don't even have to bring up them. I could bring up the Roman legions who were defeated by, by British heathens, basically. You know, you had a, 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 the, the most powerful military force in the world in, in, in Rome going into the wilds of Ireland and Britain and not returning. Uh, so it's happened numerous times throughout, throughout world history where, where forces that, sheer, that clearly outskill and outnumbered um, primitive forces would actually lose. I mean, I get that they're not... In- intimidating or as scary as the Wookiees, which I guess must have gotten you very excited at Revenge of the Sith because they have crossbows and stuff. <laughs> and CGI a bunch of them to, you know, next to each other. Um, but their own sort of innate innocence, com- you know, paired with the with the rebels, actually made for a far more interesting collaboration and battle scene than, than robots versus robots versus Wookiees. It sounds like it should be like it sounds like it should be like a one of those shitty books like a Lincoln Vampire Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Wookiees, Wookiees versus robots. <laughs> I just want to go on record as saying Tom compared anybody that was not of of, of uh, in the modern society anyone considered a savage was actually a bear cub. So just want that on record. <laughs> and, they, and they all wore loincloths and threw rocks at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and considering I know how much you love the word loincloth, I, I, I expected more sympathy toward the Ewoks than you show. <laughs> if they had mustaches, that would have made sense. But there was no mustache on any of their loincloth. They're bears. They can't have a better mustache. They're covered in hair. They, were that, they can't have any mustache. And if, no look, if the if the Ewoks had had mustaches underneath their loincloths, I would have had more sympathy. They, they had mustaches under their fur, which was under their loincloths. There was no mustache. At best, they have beards. No you one's getting this. No one's getting this joke, Tom. That except for Mike Curley. Okay, let's just move Probably. on. 
<laughs> I, I'm just, again, I'm pointing out your hypocrisy over the loincloths. That's important here. Okay. Um, let, let me go ahead and say we've had fun on this podcast kind of doing for you the same, literally almost the same argument we've been having for years now. Um, but this is also what happens when you take a fantasy movie that isn't meant for you to critically think through and um, and then go ahead and do that exercise and critically thinking about how Star Wars makes or does not make sense. And this is what you end up with. Uh, I, I would tell you, and maybe Tom would agree with this too, the best way to enjoy Star Wars is to just sit and enjoy the damn thing and not think about it too much. Otherwise, you, you get this. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Sean conclude our, our debate because I just wanted to make sure that was said. Billy Crystal not playing Lando Calrissian is the biggest casting mistake this side of Billy D. Williams not playing Two Face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, my imagination is now just running wild with Harrison Ford paired with uh, a tiny New York Jew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how that scene when he picks up when he tries to pick up Leia when they land on Cloud City would have worked if it had been Billy Crystal. Jesus, I don't know, but I want to. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God, if we ever master time travel. (laughs) (laughs) Master time travel? I'm just going to go... If I ever get money, I'm just going to go out and do it myself. Here, Billy Crystal and Carrie Carrie, Carrie Fisher, put this moo-moo on. Billy Crystal, put this cape on. Go ahead, act. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well... You both made actually astonishingly strong cases. Um, what I, my opinion is, is I believe that both of these movies, for better or worse, are products of their time. They indeed are. Um, Jedi shows, and when I say Jedi, I'm referring, of course, to the original cut of it, not the oft-disdained Lucas-revised versions of it. Yeah, you're talking um, the Yub Yub Coke is up to you version, not 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 the um, Yanni version. Yeah, much. I, I prefer the old Anakin version versus the Hayden Christensen version of Return of right. the Jedi. <laughs> um, my opinion is that displays doing as much as you can with fairly little, as all the Star Wars movies do. Um, I like the fact that the sets, for lack of other options, are done practically. Almost everything is done practically. When push comes to shove, I am always a bigger fan, almost always, I should say. I would point out that I did love Sin City, a bigger fan of practical effects over CGI. That being said... There are things about Revenge of the Sith that I certainly appreciate. Um, I think that the respective final lightsaber duels are both spectacular in their own ways. Jedi, uh, for, as Thomas pointed out, the gravitas, the emotion of the scene. And I appreciate Revenge of the Sith because, quite frankly, I had fun watching it. Okay, there. I said it. I had an absolute blast watching that watching that scene. It was a thr- it was a thrill to me, and it was one of the few moments when I actually enjoyed Hayden Christensen's performance in the two movies that he was in. That being said, to be honest, there really wasn't a whole lot about Revenge of the Sith that I really loved. Quite honestly, I wish they would have done a little more with General Grievous. I was actually very drawn in to what was done with him in the Clone Wars animated series. I thought that he could have had a much bigger part part in the movies, much like how I I felt it was unfortunate how quickly Christopher Lee was dismissed as Count Dooku. I wish that they'd given him a little more room to run. But unfortunately, you play the hand you're dealt as far as a fan goes sometimes. Jedi is not perfect either, for the reasons that Mark pointed out. But there are certainly things that are iconic and memorable that I love about them. I think, actually, that you both make very valid points when it comes to the Ewoks, much to my surprise. I really didn't anticipate the point that Thomas came up with, um, which, historically, that's very true. That's very, very true. You could also throw in some of the trouble that... um, uh, some of the Native African tribes um, gave the colonial Europeans who came over and tried to 
civilize the civilize them and stake their claim on on the continent. Um, on the other hand, Mark also made an excellent point. It doesn't make much sense that this fighting force that has, by God, stopped a mud hole in, hole in the rebels and walked it dry, barbecue sauce, <laughs> um, pretty much, pretty much got bitch slapped by teddy bears. So it's very hard to really say that I favor one person's argument over argument over the other because you both made such incredibly strong points. I mean, they don't declare necessarily hands down definitive winners at the end of presidential debates, and I'm not going to do the same as the moderator here. Here's this one. So <laughs> nice, nice save there, Sean. <laughs> Actually, well, at the end. Well, they they don't do them at the end of debate, but then they usually have somebody walk on camera from either political party and say their guy won. Yeah, exactly, uh, precisely. And and again, I mean, this, so this find me fun. a twelve year old to tell me that I'm right. Yeah. Well, and and this was fun because again, Star Wars is not for as much as I love the original three movies, is not really a fandom where I'm exactly chapter and verse knowledgeable. Not, not to the extent that most people are, nor have I really thought it through as thoroughly as you both have. I am a bit dismayed that we never got to talk about your respective stances on those independent contractors on the second Death Star. I still oh, think you that the mission has never been... George Lucas has explained that already. He actually comes out in, in the Attack of the Clones commentary and says they're actually termite creatures. He actually addresses the clerk's dialogue. In, in commentary of Attack of the Clones and Embarrass Himself. Please. It's on YouTube. Look it up. They try to embarrass the, he, he, he can't stop himself from... He, he's basically Homer Simpson, and he just can't stop embarrassing himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one. I hadn't heard it was termite creatures. Oh, yeah. Which oh, doesn't yeah. match uh, up with the dialogue, by the way, when they said, you know, we need more men. It w- so we apparently it basically went, explains them away as useless termite creatures. Well, Cold again, when the, when, when the new version of these movies come out, you know, um, whatever the next version of Blu-ray or DVD is, you know, um, 3D, I guess, when the 3D versions uh, for your home view watching come out, they'll, that, they'll just replace that line with, I need more termite creatures. Stop and then maybe we'll point a finger at them. Well... In the immortal words of Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, never mind. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, uh, that wraps the debate up. Well played, both of you. And Thomas, all of my respect, man, for, for going through all this despite just having wisdom teeth yanked. Yes, imagine if I had all of my wisdom teeth still, how badly this would have gone for Mark. Uh, well, hey, well, uh, well, hey, man, I, I think we have to at some point find another franchise to get you on here for. You know, he, uh, he, I don't think he listened to my defense of Spider-Man 3, but that was another one where, you know, yeah. he was going to travel to wherever it was I was living at the time to beat me senseless. <laughs> I, think I, I think I hate you more for Spider-Man 3 than Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> and yeah, that is uh, consistent. All right, folks, that brings to an end our debate between Return of the Jedi and Revenge of the Sith. We hope you had a good time listening back to it, and we hope to catch you again on the next Long Road to Ruin or any of our other Rattle Gym Broadcasting Network podcast here on W2M Network. Goodbye, be well, be safe, and behave.